I grew up as the eldest of um, 10 children in Harlem. My father was a fairly well-known uh, illustrator and visual artist. And uh, he was a graphic designer and a very fine draftsman and watercolorist. And he became very, very well-known as a, a Bible illustrator. And he illustrated the Bible. And I uh, admired my father greatly. And uh, I started painting outdoors in in the countryside, like when I was maybe eight or nine years old, right after the war. By the time I w went to art school, I already was really quite far ahead with drawing and uh, making watercolors and, and general sort of uh, being a young artist. And that's sort of what I wanted to be. I wanted to become an artist. Also, growing up in the Harlem art world, there were a, a lot of really very fine painters in the town of Harlem, which is sort of a middle-sized city, not very far from Amsterdam. And, um, and the tradition of Harlem painters goes back to like the, the 17th century. Great, great painters, uh, Ruisdals, uh, Frans Hals, just, just incredible great painters are Harlem painters. There's a long tradition of really beautiful painting in Harlem. There's sort of great museums there. And so I was really exposed to really fine, um, fairly traditional uh, Dutch paintings since I was really, uh, really very, very young. By the time I went to art school, it was really more like a continuation of what I already had started uh, a long time before. I studied at the uh, Rijksakademie van Beeldende Kunsten, called sort of the State Academy of Fine Arts in Amsterdam. The, uh, the academy was completely subsidized by the Dutch government. It was a school of higher education, so it was a, it was not, it was a university level school. Um, it was really quite selective. After school, I uh, did started working. I've always been sort of energetic, so I've always really worked and was really dedicated to to my work. So I just really love, I've always loved to draw and paint and I just, just really like doing it. And so I just started producing like lots of watercolors and drawings and, and was really quite successful. I just sold work, got commissions from the city of Amsterdam, the Dutch government. And so in the sort of being youthful and having girlfriends and stuff, I met uh, a young American artist in Amsterdam. And um, she turned out to be from Portland. And we became involved and um, um, got married in Amsterdam. And then she wanted to you know, see her dad and her family in Portland, and she had studied here at the uh, Museum Art School. There, there was always some fascination in the Netherlands towards the U.S., and, and I thought, I, I really felt I needed to live abroad for a while to sort of fill out my education, because I thought there was more in the world than Little Holland. She had these friends there, this old teacher of hers, uh, Mike Russo, and through Russo, the Russos, I got this introduction to the art school here, and I ended up teaching at the Museum Art School in the mid-60s as this young Dutch artist. And I rolled in here right in the middle of the Vietnamese War, of the whole counterculture period of people experimenting with LSD. Uh, and it was just an, in an entirely uh, an art world out here at Portland, which was so totally, utterly different than what I'd grown up with, so completely out of American abstraction and New York experimentation that I just, uh, I, I might as well have landed on Mars as far as I was concerned. And, uh, and it's actually taken, I, I still think I look sort of, always sort of from the outside in a little bit out here, and, and, uh, uh, including looking at the art world. But I didn't come to the United States to become an art teacher. That was not. But the art teacher was sort of a way to get a green card and, and get here and survive. So um, I came here. I think I had $50. That was all I had. And uh, I was at the time misled. I thought I was going to you know, 
teach there through the year, but I only apparently got a teaching position for like three months or got paid for three months. I had already a baby. So we were very, very poor here and so poor that there was really no way for me to travel and stuff. And I was um, sort of trapped here in a way. And so I was asked to teach an, a second year. And so I taught like two years here and then I returned to Holland. But in the process, I became close to the students. And the students were sort of my, more my generation. And they were also curious about the world. And, and they were adventurous. And they took me places. The students took me to the beach. They took me to the desert. They befriended me, um, as opposed to my colleagues. And um, so I got close to students. And the students were, a lot of the young men, they were afraid of the war because the Vietnamese war had then sort of come to full bloom and stuff and a lot of kids were taken out of class and taken to Vietnam. So there was a lot of tension there and, and I got sort of drawn into that. I got drawn into making uh, political drawings and political posters and sort of got drawn sort of into the turmoil of the times. and. Since I had moved from, you know, safe Holland to this huge country and um, left really everything behind, I had sort of built up there. My whole life was sort of in turmoil also, so that sort of the whole, my whole world had sort of come to this incredible explosion in a, in a way. And I think that sort of reflected itself in my work and so I started experimenting with my work and sort of these anxieties uh, I felt got into into the paintings and then I had this a series of shows here at uh, the White Gallery at um, Portland State and so this kind of expressionism I came which was utterly different from the color field paintings people were making here um, caused um, a great deal of uh, upheaval and uh, controversy. So, consequently, um, in a very short time, I was widely known because there was an enormous amount of press and anger and um, just uh, debate about uh, the kind of work I was doing, and uh, a lot of people were very offended by it and. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of people who really widely admired it, so there was just this incredible uh, excitement about my work. But it's the, the effect of it was that I was very, very well known in a very short time. Then I thought, if I'm going to be an art teacher here, then I'll just be spending really most of my time just teaching and talking about art. But really, what I really wanted to continue was my career as a as an independent artist, as a painter. So I elected not to uh, become a teacher and because of all the previous turmoil with all the drug taking of the students and all that um, although I've never really been greatly enamored by by that it was sort of a reality at the time that people were doing that I always thought it was really dangerous because you only have one brain to ruin so um, I decided not to go back to the into the art school situation and um, started working for myself, and I thought I better find um, ways to um, make a living here. And so, I, and since I didn't really know anybody, it was a really a, just a, this Dutch kid from Holland who had really no roots here whatsoever. Um, I thought, well, I've d I have all this big background in in drawing and and portraiture. I should start making myself known as a portrait artist. And I started drawing uh, in at cultural events, started drawing children's portraits for like a dollar a piece or three bucks for a color drawing. And then uh, um, I drew like three portraits on one drawing and, and, and people would give me a $10 bill and, I, and I'd wait for the dollar back. And I just drew like this, all these portraits for like several periods of time and within an extremely short period of time there were like I don't know maybe 30 40 children's portraits floating around the art community or uh, Portland community 
finding you know all these different places and stuff and and um and I had done these things so immediately and spontaneously and I had such good likenesses with these kids because of my drawing background um all of a sudden there was a portrait commission and and uh, and so I started painting children's portraits And the children's portraits, in the beginning, they sort of kept me sort of going. And then that one children's portrait led to like three other children's portraits. And then they painted, these were oil paintings. And they sort of got into the more, um, into more into the art world scene, so to speak. And so then I think in 1976 it was, that was a little bit later then, so a number of years later, I had also become involved in a store from theater and started designing sets. I grew up with portraits and, uh, and my father had models in a studio and, and uh, there were always portraits around the house. So I grew up with the making of portraits, it just came with me from my childhood. And we had some really very, very fine portrait painters being professors at the academy. So there was just a tremendous focus on portraiture. And we started drawing, really looking at the characteristics of faces and structure of faces and how faces were built and what is unique about an individual. Uh, and the sort of having a sort of insight into drawing people and their body language uh, and the, li the way the light falls on them. And the the scale and proportions of this sort of came with the, you know, the work we did. So by the time, uh, you know, I was out of school, I really had a fairly, fairly good grasp about how to draw a face or a body or draw anything for that matter. I lived at the time so much on the edge, you know, so much, my life was so fragile, you know, and so much, you know, times of living on food stamps, being incredibly poor, uh, living in a sort of, Working with a sort of political uh, little theater, which did experimental theater, which sort of also tried to sort of push the edges and stuff. We were really sort of really very much a little bit on the outside. We were not. I was not living a very comfortable life, and because of my experiences with the local art community, um, I was really very much on the outside of it. In fact, there was kind of a hostility between me and a local art community as it had sort of uh, not really embraced me wholeheartedly. Um, so I, I, I was sort of in a, in a place where I was in a really sort of paranoid and, uh, and defensive in, in many ways uh, in my work and not that conscious of um, McCall's environmental things. I was sort of like, there was a huge, uh, you know, I would, I would more sort of looking at the, the political turmoil in this country, the huge conflicts of the wars and the demonstrations and um, I would draw, you know, there was the American Legion Convention here in the early 70s and I'd go out and there'd be this extremely violent demonstrations and I'd go out in the middle of these demonstrations with a sketchbook and I would draw the, the demonstrators and I would draw the police in the hiding in these parking buildings and I'd sit there and make drawings of them and I'd walk down the street and make drawings actually of these scenes there just right in the thick of it. And I would li write letters about these scenes in Dutch to my friends in Holland and I'd send them the sketchbooks and I'd have, a, I'd have these letters published in the Netherlands about what life was like in America during that. That was sort of more what I was do, doing during the time when McCall was uh, governor. It was more like, it was edgier. I got a phone call if I was interested in uh, painting a portrait of Governor McCall. And I was on a very short list. I was, you know, I was really startled by the proposition, but at the same time, um, I, um, of course, thought it was just really very wonderful. I, I tend to, I really like to do research. I think that if, if I would not have gotten into the arts, uh, I would have gotten into some sort of, sci into some sort of science. I'd, I'd, I, I really like to study things and I really love doing research. And I 
research. A lot of my paintings have oftentimes a whole bunch of research behind them. I don't just burst forth in creativity. I just oftentimes just do a lot of groundwork. I, I went to the library and I got like a tome called Maverick, a self-portrait, a, a sort of a book here, autobiography, and I, re and I read it. And to sort of get an idea about what, 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 what the, wh who, who he was and how he sort of viewed himself and if there was anything in his autobiography which would sort of indicate a painting, where there was somewhere a painting there in the story and, and where that painting would be and what that painting would be like. Because I thought it would be great, since I had already been doing that with other portraits, to paint people in some sort of context, then the context would be having something to do with themselves, so the context would not be just some sort of arbitrary background or whatever, but it would have something to do with their life or achievement or interest or something about their world. So the painting as a whole would be the portrait rather than the detail in it, which would be the representation of the individual. So um, I'm sort of armed with that. There was this meeting uh, at the or the historical society where I met like a Norma Paulus and Norma said we would like to have a portrait of Governor McCall. There used to be governor, you know, there used to be governor portraits at the state capitol because the, but they were all burned because of the fire. So and since then there were no other portraits. And since uh, Governor McCall was real ill at the time, and since uh, Norma Paulus thought that he was really the greatest governor ever in the state of Oregon. There should be a, a portrait of him. With what I then knew, um, I said it would be really great to do a portrait of him. But since he is not only a great man in the in the memory of uh, Oregon history and Oregon politics, as he sort of stands as a as a giant in the in the in the history of uh, of Oregon, I also thought, since he was such an incredibly tall man, such a rising figure, it would be great to paint a life-size portrait of him rather than a part of him or his head cut off his body or stuff, but his whole body. Somehow, it struck me he should be painted like a full-length portrait. That would be great. I, th I think that Norman was sort of taken aback by that a little bit and said, well, yeah, that'd be a very big portrait. You can only have a portrait of Tom McCall if you set up some pro kind of program where all governors in perpetuity are painted. Otherwise, we cannot do this. We have to set up some sort of program, and then the Tom McCall painting would be the first painting of the subsequent portraits of the governors into the future. A large p painting would also mean that he would be symbolically larger than other governors who might have, you know, smaller portraits, and therefore that would cause uh, political conflicts within the whole portrait business, which was <laughs> somewhat a startling uh, realization. And I, so I just said, well, I, d I said really. Politics is not my field. I, I don't know what to say about that. I just, uh, but I, I think that's, I think how he should be painted. And, and that should have something to do with the painting, something to do with his, his achievement. And his achievements are in the Oregon landscape and the protection of the Oregon landscape. So it'd be great to paint him in a landscape where, which has something to do, which he projected. With of a landscape which was his landscape in a way. And at the time I had run across this story uh, where Tom McCall described himself that I stood at the beach and I was holding in my hand a 16-foot pole and perpendicular to that pole towards the land was a string and where that string would reach, touch the land, that triangle from the low, low water line, describes the beach in that area would be the protected beach, which was what some OSU people had come up with, this, this, this principle. And of course, standing at the edge of the ocean and the, and the continent with a, with a great measurement 
you know, measuring the, the, the tides and the forces of nature, the forces of the sun and the moon and the earth, uh, seems like a, a, a dramatic, larger than life, sort of mythological, heroic uh, thing to do. And, uh, and, it, and it sort of corresponded with, to me, with this heroic, you know, grand stature. And ironically, also, he was standing himself at the very edge of his life and the hereafter, so to speak. So he was himself standing at some edge of two worlds, in a way. So it, that all sort of came together. So I just sort of thought that that would be the moment to paint to paint him. Of course, you know, it never really, in reality, took place. Like he was helicoptered down there, and there was a bunch of people out there, and there was a lot of press and all that. But Somehow, in my in my imagination, uh, sort of responding to how he described himself, that seemed to become the image, and sort of also it seemed to me like that the threat to the beach was sort of the encroachment of the sort of technological world onto the American wilderness, which is sort of a subject which I have been sort of exploring over the years. You know, like the tension between the great American landscape and the great American technological achievements and how that comes to an incredible clash and has become a, a tremendous conflict in this sort of insertion of like high technology into the wilderness and how the mobile quality of technology into these wild worlds. And so I d inside decided to insert this helicopter image into this image, not only that how that's how he got to the beach, as he described himself, but also it would sort of in a way symbolize what was happening to the wilderness and so So that's sort of how this thing came together. And then um, later on when I was introduced to Governor McCall at his home, I had this pretty much in mind what I wanted to do, and then I could pose him in a way with already having that kind of painting in mind. So when I went down there and met him, I just uh, had, took a camera. It was just too brief a time to, to make drawings and, and uh, too fluid a situation. So I took a camera and I described to him whether what kind of portrait I had in mind I wanted to do, and if he was willing, if that would seem okay with him, if he would like to be portrayed in that manner as standing on the beach and maybe greeting someone on the beach, one of his citizens, and with his 16-foot pole involved in this grand scheme of this measuring, this Newtonian act, so to speak. So um, he thought that was just great. He was very lively and very animated, and so we took him out in the yard, in his backyard, and I have a photograph of Norman Paul sort of holding him. He was really quite ill, and he had this uh, bone cancer. And so I just uh, stood in the yard and sort of oriented him towards the sun, so the sun would come from the west, so the light would strike him in a proper angle. Uh, walking south down the beach, lights coming in from the side, and I say, okay, governor, you're walking down the beach, now do something. You know, you're meeting your, your, your folks out there, your Oregonians, and so he would just gesture his hands and he'd sweep his arms, and I went click, 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 and I ran out of film. <laughs> and that was it. Then he was became, you know, really painful and stuff, and he sort of got back inside, and that was sort of the heart of the of the whole setup of the whole thing. So I had these images. And then I had to select a beach. And I went to Cape Mears, and I, was, I had heard about Cape Mears had these incredible st stumps and trees and logs and rubble, and it was just sort of the essential beach out there. And I started making watercolors at Cape Mears and documented Cape Mears to use as a background setting for it. And then I started then sort of based on the slides and the watercolors, and, the, and the, then I had started making, using the slides to make large drawings and sort of start to sort of work towards these studies. So I, by the time I 
got to work on the painting, I knew every passage and every wrinkle and every spot on his skin and every gesture and his overbite and the whole thing. So by the time I got to work on a painting, I knew exactly what he looked like because I had done these extremely precise detailed drawings based on these preliminary studies. And then during this sort of preliminary period, I thought that I have all this photo documentation, but I don't really know him. I, it's still like, you know, copying a photograph and on based on a brief meeting and it's just not enough for me to paint a portrait on because after all, he may be ill and he may be not having long to live, but that's in the future. I mean, he's still there and he's still Governor McCall as far as I'm concerned and it's not my fault that people waited till so late in his life. And he's very much there and it would be disrespectful to treat him otherwise. And so I went out of my way, setting up a sitting with him. So, so I got to really make a drawing from life and got to talk to him personally and really meet. So I was really painting a human being and there was some sort of interaction between me and Governor McCall on a personal level. So I was really making somebody's portraits. And also that he was aware of me doing this portrait. And so after a number of, um, phone calls back and forth, I may have made his arrangement. And I went to his home with a very large piece of drawing paper and a little table and a jar of ink. And Governor McCall sat in a chair across from me on a sort of a sunny day and sat in his chair and he said, you draw me. And I just sort of did this really precise life drawing from him. Right in the middle of the drawing, I was drawing his drawing, there was a great deal of tension. His wife would come in and talk to me and all that. And he was sitting there and all of a sudden he just sent him. Uh, and he sort of collapsed right in front of me. And he sat there for a long time, you know, just sort of like in agony and motionless. And I stood there and sort of like, oh my God, you know. Now what? Maybe he died. And, uh, and so he slowly sort of sat back up and I said, you know, you don't have to do this. On my account, you don't have to suffer for the stupid drawing. You know, I don't have to do this drawing. No, he said, no, you draw, you draw, you draw, keep on drawing. And he sat there. And in a way, it sort of also sort of broke the ice in a way, you know. And so I did this drawing. And by the time the drawing was done, we really knew each other. And we just sort of developed this really great rapport, which really continued throughout the whole program of that I did this painting. So I got a, like late night calls and you, I'm going to live forever through your painting. I did a number of drawings of him using this photo documentation he had made where he'd made all these gestures with his arms, shaking his hand and sweeping gestures, close ups of his face and used those images to make these, all these various images and I made transpose those onto this drawing paper and then used various aspects of Cape mirrors and to sort of collage or combine these things and see what would happen if I would do that. And in the meantime, sort of get a real sense about the structure of his face and, and his likeness and his manner and stuff. And also because some of these things, these drawings were so incredibly intimate they would sort of probably transcend a little bit about what I could do in a public painting. Although it's unfortunate that you have to consider. I think you should go as far as you can with the painting under any circumstances. But by doing drawing this extreme, drawing this extreme close-ups of his face, I could get every spot and every line and every uh, blemish and every thing which was characteristic about him into these drawings and then take like details out of the landscape and sort of fuse those all together. I have sort of the intent of them and by that time when I'd be done with these drawings I would have all the supporting material. I think that would be have some sort of historical quality and at the same time I would by the time I would painting I would be extremely informed about what I was actually doing without having to have a great deal of sittings with him. And my plan was to use like initial materials to draw his life-size composition 
uh, of him and then have him come in at the very end, the very last moment when the painting was nearly done. Then I have him come to the studio and then with a hand palette just paint in a whole layer of corrections from life so that finally with the layer of paint you would finally see of him in the actual painting would actually be painted from life and would have that kind of direct uh, immediate uh, quality about it so it would be vivid and lifelike and, and it would have a certain energy to it uh, which would be gone if you would be stuck with a rendering from a photograph. But at the same time, the photographic material and the initial drawings and the drawing I'd done from life would sort of work very well as an underpainting. It's a drawing of McCall I uh, drew from life, and it's now in, a, in the uh, Gordon Gilkey uh, collection at the Portland Art Museum. That's a drawing I did from life. This drawing here is an extreme close-up of his face, which deals primarily with his mouth and the sort of express, expressive quality he had with his, with his mouth, which I really wanted to get into this painting. He was a very animated person. He liked to talk. And um, so I wanted to have that, quali that sort of quality of animation into the piece, which is a hard thing to do. So. I did these uh, detailed drawings of, of his face really close in. And those were a large drawing. I mean, the face itself in the drawing would be about this big. This is a helicopter study and a profile. It has a heavenly body in it here, which I uh, omitted later on. I thought that would be not, not necessary to make it so Newtonian that it becomes uh, distracting in the painting. But I made a drawing of it to see uh, what would happen in that case. So there's the sort of moon-like um, body in, in the suspended in the sky, and there's one drawing out here. And these, n these drawings here are highly evolved approaches to the way he sits, uh, his profile sort of uh, seen against the light. There's a lot of experimentation with with the light, it's so you sort of like silhouette it against the landscape and, uh, and it'd be sort of the light would sort of come out of the painting itself, so the painting would be sort of luminous, as if a light would radiate from the painting itself, sort of lit from behind. So these are all these sort of uh, experimentations with that. This drawing here are initial studies for the actual painting. This is what I actually selected to do for the painting itself. <coughs> the last sitting, uh, uh, he was really quite ill by then, and I had this little studio, and I had this in, uh, in, in the east side in Portland, and it was cold in there, so I had a big wood stove, and I stoked it up hot. And uh, my friend Dolores came with me, and we'd sort of borrowed the station wagon, and we'd sort of draped him in the back of the car, and, and we'd driving down from his house on Upper Broadway to my studio, and he said, well, he said, you know, I'd, I'm glad that I'm getting out of the house because I've been busy all week arranging my funeral. But he said, through you I will live forever on the walls of the Capitol. So I'll be glad to come into your studio. So there he was, just really very, very ill. Put him on his chair, and I had this painting there, and he was amazed by his painting. And so while I was painting on this portrait with his hand palette, just painting his face, he just was so curious about everything doing that he was, in these photographs you can see, first he sits sort of straight up, and as further we get in this painting, he's leaning over more and more, trying to see what he's doing. He's practically falling off his chair with curiosity. So even at the very last end of his life, where he was really very uncomfortable, um, he was still very much engaged with, uh, with what it was his life and who he was and what he was doing, and really liked sitting for this painting. The most, of, most of what I know about the response about the painting is more hearsay than that I have e ever got any kind of personal uh, situation with them. The, my only encounter really with Mrs. McCall was when I drew his portrait, his, the drawing I, d I did from life uh, there at his home. And I had a very nice conversation with her and, and really uh, what came out in this conversation, as I remember it, it's uh, 20 years ago, how much he loved him 
and admired him and, and how pleased he was that I was doing this and and how concerned he was about his health and 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 uh, and I got a really profound sense of affection and sadness uh, from Mrs. McCall. I remember I remember that clearly in this sort of sunny formal sitting room they had in their home up there on the hill. The unveiling. Uh, there was already sort of a, a sense about where this painting was going to be. Um, Norma had sort of pointed it out from this would be the wall where it's going to hang. And that, that was this marble wall and it was going to hang between sort of the House of Representatives and the, uh, and the governor office at upstairs in the state capitol. So that was good to know because I could sort of be sensitive to the color in the painting into where this painting was going to hang, so the painting would really respond to the wall, or uh, there would be some, the painting would look good on that wall by being conscious of the color of the wall and the tonality of it. Mm. We went down there one night, and, we, and I actually hung that painting there myself. We had these hooks there and these clips and hung it on the wall with the steel cables and stuff, make sure that the thing was lit properly and all that, and it hung there. And then some drape or flag or some object was hung over it, and Norman Pauls helped with it. Anyway, I have photographs of that, hanging all the painting there one night. Dolores came with me and took pictures. And then, of course, while I was doing the work on all this painting, um, the, the word had gotten out f from it, and, I, and it made me nervous because um, having to live with my work in this in this relatively small town, uh, my existence, you know, economically has always been somewhat precarious, and my career could, in my opinion at the time, could stand or fall with it. And I thought, you know, if I fail with this painting, uh, this painting would be a turkey. It'd be really bad news for not only it'd be an embarrassment for my clients, but it would also be really not very good for me. You know, I really wanted to paint this painting to succeed for a number of reasons, and th primarily of all, I, you know, and it may not be overly professional, but I really, st I really liked McCall. I just really, st really was concerned about him, and I really, really liked him. I thought he was just a wonderful person and uh, really great to deal with. There was a kind of spontaneity and creativity about him, which I found extremely appealing, and I found him just generally very engaging and very open, and and he'd call me in the middle of the night, and we'd have these conversations and stuff. It was just a, a really, and you know, and he was really, he didn't want to die at all. It was just something that was, was sad about it. And at the same time, it was this really engaging uh, commission. And at the same time, I felt like there was a lot of people looking over my shoulder. So I wanted to, for Governor McCall's sake, and for my own sake, and of course, for the nature of the commission, the clients, I wanted the painting to be successful and uh, be a, a tribute to Governor Call and be a really beautiful, effective, powerful, dramatic painting as he himself was, in a sense. You know, and I thought that would also be a career enhancing as well. So it, it was the farthest from me to make a painting which would be in any way offensive or controversial or whatever, I wanted the painting to be liked. And so, and, uh, and my client was very happy with the painting. And I, I think that sort of in the rule of, of portrait painting or any commission, you work for the client and if the client is happy, who cares what everybody else thinks, you know, it's irrelevant. As long as a client likes it and I get paid, I think the commission is in that sense as an interaction is successful. However, it's had a larger, there's a larger context in which this happened. And at the same time, s since it was known that I was doing this portrait, I was paranoid about it a little bit. And I, and I, I'm self-conscious about it and stuff. And I, this painting was sort of visible in my studio and I was sort of in this little storefront and, and uh, that I closed the windows, you know, closed the curtains so people couldn't see it and stuff. And I wanted to be sort of private about it and not get people in my studio and knows about it and give a running commentary. I wanted to sort of work on this thing 
privately as if it were a private thing I was doing for myself without a lot of interference. Uh, so I feel free with it. But I had to be, and I had to be free with the painting in order for the painting to succeed and be, you know, done with confidence. I had to have, a, I had to be confident in order to, in order for the painting to express a sense of confidence and an assuredness. I had to be myself, be self-assured with it. So it was sort of a, a trying psychologically because there was all this curiosity about it and stuff and speculation and things and my background in terms of being a controversial artist. So anyway, uh, so far so good. Uh, we had this thing framed and all that and hung on the wall and then there was this big unveiling and there were like a tremendous amount of people there all in rows and all that and sitting in the state capitol and cloth in front of it. And huge television lights were overlighting that painting, no end, because paintings need to be seen under very low light. You have to paint a painting under bright lights, and then a painting has to be seen under very low light, not bright light. People out here tend to do the reverse out here. And yeah, you go to a gallery and I just put this smack of light on artworks, and I think it just destroys most of them. I think it's really lighting in general is really very poorly on paintings in these settings. So there was this blast of light in this thing, which just, of course, just wiped out every subtlety in this thing and just made it sort of just And then there were some speeches given, and, uh, and I was sitting in the middle, and uh, Mrs. McCall was in front and all that, and for the rest, I don't know what happened. There was a little opening, and those microphones stuck in my faces, and I made some comments and all that, and then I was over. As, and so whatever happened with the painting, what, whatever said about the painting or felt about the painting, whatever, was never really directly towards me. I never got any call about a painting, anybody saying anything about it, other than things appearing in the press where, where you know, various writers in the Oregonia and various things uh, all of a sudden started to opinionate about their ability to make judgments about formal portraiture. And that was amusing and, and at times irritating, but for the rest, um, harmless. And, and there was a lot of really wonderful, great photographs, a great article in the Register Guard with the beautiful big color photos and a great article in the Oregonian and all that. So. In terms of controversy, it sort of came sort of to me in sort of secondary sort of rumors about it, including a rumor that Mrs. McCall really didn't like the painting, and which surprised me greatly. And, um, and an effort on the part of, I believe, Mrs. McCall and then Governor Goldsmith to take the painting down by having a Christmas party and then say, it was a Christmas party, we'll take the painting down, we'll put it in a closet, and we'll never hang it back up, and then you don't have to worry about it, which actually happened. And with interference of Mrs. Paulus and uh, I believe Jane Sees, who then decided that the painting didn't really belong to the governor, but to the legislature, and this particular committee that there was no real, that nobody had actually any kind of rights to fool around with this portrait, and so the painting was, resurrected and hung back up there. This is all things I heard. And then the last McCall thing, I was at the state capitol and I ran into a fellow who was the Secretary of State, what was his name, who just said to me that that outrageous painting of, made some reference to the outrageous painting of Governor McCall, which again, left me somewhat speechless because I still think that it's probably of all these portraits really very the strongest painting I have there. But uh, that, that's all I know about the controversy. I'm very proud of it. I think it's, I looked at it occasionally when I go down there and now this painting has sort of receded in the past. Uh, you know, I look at this thing and I just sort of wondered how in the hell I did it. The paintings change because I change, you know. So what, 
what looks to me like every day kind of thing as I keep working and my work sort of evolves. It doesn't necessarily get better, but it changes. Um, my way of how I have access, thanks to my good friend the Gamelins, to a lot more oil paint than I used to. I used to be use paint very sparingly uh, because oil paint is very expensive. So I used to paint really very thinly and uh, economically. And at the time, I painted them call painting very, very thinly, and I used store-bought Belgian blocks paint for it, which is an exquisite paint, which is very, very expensive. And um, yeah, in retrospect, I didn't really get that much money for that painting, and I, you know, I had to sort of really be frugal about how I used my materials. So the painting is really very thinly painted, and I used to adjust my technique to the way I used paint. So I used to paint really thin and use very small sable brushes and I would sand between layers, sand this painting down so it would be very, very smooth and I used the sable brushes and glaze this very, very thin opaque glazes over it and then paint with this very small brushes into the glazes and after a while this painting has got this meticulous, very precise, clear quality about it. As I got access to more paint, I became more like, I started getting more into my old manner of painting, which is just using lots of paint and using this really very visceral, sensuous surfaces like this painting behind me. It's got like a ton of paint on it and it has an entirely different quality, the surface of it, and I find much more expressive approach to make in a painting as I did then. So as I make more paintings, and I make far more paintings than I did at the time. My work has changed. And then you sort of look back and you look sort of into a time warp a little bit.